Chapter 5, The Judiciary. The judicial branch is discussed in Article 3 of the uh, U.S. Constitution. So the judicial branch is composed of the Supreme Court and federal courts that are located all across the country. And, and later on, I'm going to explain uh, how that works. There are several different kinds of lower level federal courts uh, that are located in every part of the country, including uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, but uh, as you all probably know, there's only one Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and that Supreme Court is the highest court in the entire country. So uh, basically what, uh, what I'm talking about here with the judicial branch is the court system, the federal court system in the United States that deals with federal court cases, issues of federal law, uh, and issues of federal government actions. Uh, state laws are dealt with in state courts. Local laws are, are dealt with in local courts. So uh, just the way that federalism allows the national state and local governments to have their own laws, so too are there uh, separate court systems uh, that deal with uh, national, state, and local. So today we're just talking about the national court system, the federal court system, which is made up of the Supreme Court and federal courts that are located all across the country. When you look at the judicial branch, uh, in comparison with the other two branches of, of our federal government, the executive branch and the legislative branch, the judicial branch, the judiciary, is very unique among the three branches of the government in that its leaders are unelected. So the president is the head of the executive branch. The president becomes the president because we, the people, elect the president. Same thing goes for members of Congress. Members of the House of Representatives and members of the Senate are both elected by the people. Judges... Uh, federal court judges and Supreme Court justices, uh, just another word for, for a judge, are not elected by the people. They are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And we talked about that uh, in the last uh, lecture, uh, how the Senate uh, has a special authority uh, to confirm several kinds of people that are appointed by the president, including federal judges and Supreme Court justices. So the judicial branch is very, very different because none of the leaders in that judicial branch, all these judges, and there are hundreds of them in the United States, are not elected. Okay. So because judges are not elected, the judiciary's legitimacy depends on, on the public trusting the judiciary to be fair and impartial. What that means is, well, so what do we mean by legitimacy? The, the perception that this person uh, has a right to be there, has a right to do that job, has... Uh, the authority of the American people because that's how our government operates, right? As a democratic republic, the power of the government comes from the people because we elect them. So uh, since we don't elect judges, the judiciary's legitimacy, their, their ability to, to maintain respect depends on the public trusting the judiciary to be fair and impartial, uh, that they're doing the right thing, that they are doing the honest thing and interpreting the law honestly as they should. Uh, that's kind of hard for the courts to do, though, because maintaining a sense of legitimacy, of respect, is hard because courts often rule and very divisive culture war issues. And, and, and what I mean by culture war issues is the kind of social issues that people fight about uh, very, very passionately. Uh, these are moral issues that people feel very strongly about, like abortion, 
religious rights issues and issues of race and gender. These are the kinds of things that uh, get people arguing uh, very passionately with each other about. And the courts have to rule about these kinds of things over whether abortion should be legal or not, how how much religious rights we have to do certain things, how many how much rights people have to be protected from discrimination, race, and gender, things like that. How much equality we should give to women in certain respects, or or African Americans. These are the kinds of issues that really pull people apart. These kinds of culture issues, and so uh, the court, uh, the Supreme Court, especially when it rules on these kinds of divisive issues never pleases everybody. Somebody is going to be happy. One group of people is going to like what they decided. Other people are not going to like it and think that they made the decision completely wrong for the wrong reasons, and they're often criticized for that. Just in the past couple of weeks, the Supreme Court has made uh, a few very uh, uh, very close calls, very divisive uh, conclusions uh, some of which uh, went against uh, what President Donald Trump hoped the Supreme Court would do. And because of that, uh, Donald Trump went, went on Twitter and criticized the Supreme Court. So these are the kinds of things I'm talking about with these cultural issues being very divisive and, and putting the courts right smack in the middle of these uh, divisive issues. Because of that, the courts have become politicized. Uh, when a uh, when the Supreme Court, for for example, uh, makes a decision that Republicans like Democrats will uh, criticize it and say, "Well, they made it. You know, they made the decision because this is a very conservative court," and they, and and. Republican judges on the court uh, voted the way they did, not because that's what they believe the law means, but because they're Republicans. And, and when uh, the court rules against Republicans, then, uh, then the Republicans uh, get angry and say, well, the court's being too liberal. It's being too, de being, being too much like the Democratic Party. So the court system, unfortunately, has become... Uh, politicized, and that's unfortunate because the founding fathers uh, did not want the federal courts to be politicized, and, and that's exactly why they made the court uh, system and the judicial branch uh, made up of unelected judges. They, the, the founding fathers specifically did not want the courts to be like the uh, legislative branch and the executive branch. They didn't want the leaders of, of of the judiciary, the judges, to be elected because they thought they would be too much uh, at the whim of public opinion. They did not want judges to make decisions based on whether they thought that the voters would reelect them or not. They wanted judges to make decisions based solely on what they believed the law required. And so because the founding fathers did not want federal courts to be politicized, they made sure that judges and big court justices are not elected. And even more than that, they uh, put in, they wrote into the constitution that federal judges and Supreme Court justices would serve for life. So not only are they not elected, not only are they appointed and nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate, but once a federal judge is in office, once the Supreme Court justice is in office, they're there for life until they die or until they decide to step down and retire. Uh, so most judges actually do serve until they die. Uh, and uh, and that again is 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 to totally insulate them from politics. Uh, judges can be removed, but only through impeachment. Only if uh, it's shown that judges did something corrupt, 
or broke the law or did something immoral. So it's very difficult to remove a judge, just like it's very difficult to remove a president of the United States because the mechanism for removing judges is the same as for removing a president. You have to impeach them. Now, another uh, interesting thing about the judiciary, if you compare it to today with how the Founding Fathers wanted it to be and act like, is that the Founding Fathers did not want the Supreme Court to be as powerful as it is today. If you read the Constitution, if you read Article 3 of the Constitution, it basically only says that the court should interpret law and resolve disputes. Right. Today, however, the Supreme Court does a lot more because today the Supreme Court has the power of what's called judicial review. And judicial review is a very important power that the Supreme Court has to rule a law or government action on constitutional. And it's actually not not uh, not just something that the Supreme Court uh, can do, but uh, other uh, federal courts in the United States also have the power to judicial review, not just to interpret a law and to, to, to say what it means if there are two different groups suing each other because they disagree about what the law says and what the law means and what the law requires, but to go even one step further with judicial review, the courts have the power to say that this law shouldn't even be a law because it's unconstitutional or to say that the president can't do something he's done because uh, it's unconstitutional. It goes against the Constitution. So, uh, so today the courts, and especially the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the country, uh, not only has the power to interpret the law, but also has the power to interpret the Constitution, review the Constitution, review laws to make sure that they are not unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court didn't always have this uh, power. So the Supreme Court came into being in 1789, the first year that the new government under the Constitution went into effect. It's also the same year, 1789, that we had our first presidential election, the year that George Washington became our first president. The Supreme Court didn't come up with the uh, idea of judicial review, didn't first exercise judicial review until 1803. Uh, so almost 15 years after the start of the new government. Uh, and the Supreme Court first exercised judicial review in the 1803 Supreme Court case Marbury versus Madison. So uh, this uh, was a court case uh, that was brought by uh, Marbury, William Marbury, uh, who was a lawyer uh, who was uh, appointed to be a chief justice, uh, a, a, sorry, not a chief justice, but a justice of the peace in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1801. Uh, 1801 was an important year because it, that was the very end of the presidency of John Adams, uh, and John Adams was the second president of the United States. He succeeded uh, George Washington as the second president of the United States. And in the final days of his, uh, of his presidency in 1801, he uh, appointed uh, this guy, William Marbury, to be a chief just, uh, a justice of the peace, excuse me, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was the end of his presidency because John Adams had run for election in the election of 1800, but he lost. Uh, and he lost to Thomas Jefferson, who was about to become the new president of the United States, the third president of the United States. That election of 1800 was a very important uh, election because it was the first time that 
a president of one party was about to hand over power to the president of another party. John Adams and, and Thomas Jefferson were from two different political parties. Uh, John Adams was a member of the Federalist Party, one of the first two political parties to exist in the United States. The Federalist Party was a party that believed very strongly in federalism, that believed in the idea of having a strong federal government, a strong national government. Thomas Jefferson, however, was a member of the Democratic Republican Party, which was anti-federalist. Uh, and so Thomas Jefferson did not want the federal government to be as strong as John Adams and George Washington, who was also a federalist, wanted. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wanted to weaken the power of the federal government relative to the power of the state governments. So uh, this was a monumental time period here in, in, uh, in 1801, the final days of the Adams administration, uh, because uh, Adams knew that the things that he did as president would be undone by Thomas Jefferson. But one thing that he, uh, that Adams uh, could do that Jefferson would not be able to undo was to appoint judges. Uh, and so one of the, one of the, and then uh, the justice of the peace, the, the kind of judge I'm talking about here, uh, is a very small time judge that didn't require Senate confirmation. So all that needed to happen was for uh, John Adams to sign a piece of paper uh, making William Marbury a judge. So he did that. Uh, however, because uh, John Adams did this the night before he Tom Jefferson became the new president, uh, John Adams was able to sign the order making Marbury a judge, but the order was not properly uh, filed in time. Uh, before Jefferson could become president. So when Jefferson became president, uh, he ordered his new Secretary of State, James Madison, and that's where the Madison comes in, Marbury sues Madison, uh, because uh, uh, Madison, on the order of his new president, James Mad uh, Tom Jefferson, uh, did not uh, file the order uh, making Marbury a judge. So Jefferson said, uh, all the orders that haven't been filed yet, James Madison, I want you to destroy because I'm going to uh, go ahead and appoint my own people for these uh, judge positions. So Marbury knew that Madison had not, uh, had not filed the order. He knew that Adams uh, had made him a judge. And so he uh, was naturally upset that he wasn't going to get his job. And he believed that what Jefferson and Madison had done by not filing the order that was signed by John Adams when Adams was still president was illegal. He believed that this was a violation of law. And so he filed a, uh, a, uh, a case with the Supreme Court. Uh, why the Supreme Court? Because uh, we're talking about Washington, D.C. here, which is not a state. Uh, Washington, D.C. is a federal territory, a territory that's run by the federal government. And so he went to the federal courts all the way up to the Supreme Court to file his, his lawsuit against Madison and in the lawsuit, he asked the Supreme Court to order James Madison to file the order and that would make Marbury a judge and allow him to take that position. So the uh, Supreme Court uh, had to basically rule uh, on whether Marbury had a right to his job, whether John Adams had appropriately uh, appointed William Marbury. 
the chief justice of the Supreme Court at the time was a guy by the name of John Marshall, uh, who, uh, by the way, was a cousin of Thomas Jefferson's. John Marshall was a very smart guy, and one of the things he was worried about here was the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court doesn't really have a lot of power to enforce its, uh, its decisions. Uh, yes, the Supreme Court can make a, a decision and order the president or Congress or a state government to do something, but as we, as I already explained in uh, lecture two, when I talked about uh, lecture th uh, th uh, three, sorry about federalism, it, we we saw during the uh, civil rights movement how uh, Southern states easily defied the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court doesn't have a police force or a military that it can use to enforce its order. So John Marshall felt that if he uh, ordered James Madison and the president, Tom Jefferson, to give Marbury his job, that because Jefferson was from a different party and, and didn't want to give Marbury his job, Jefferson might say, well, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. You know, they can't do anything about it. I'm the president. I decide who's going to be a judge. And so instead, what John Marshall wrote, uh, what John Marshall and the Supreme Court concluded was that, yes, uh, William Marbury should be a judge that John Adams legally signed the order and that uh, it was just a small little problem that it was filed uh, while Adams was still president. Marbury should still be president. I mean, still, should still be a judge. Uh, and then, uh, but, however, Marshall then said, but we have no power to order the president or the Secretary of State, James Madison, to uh, give Marbury his job because the law that Marbury is using to sue is unconstitutional. Now, the law that Marbury was using uh, to, that he used to bring his lawsuit was the Judiciary Act of 1789, which was a law that Congress passed uh, in its first year, uh, which set up the court system. Because if you look at Article Three of the of, of the Constitution, it doesn't say a lot about how the court system, the federal court system in the United States, is supposed to work. It, it actually is very short and very vague and just simply says the judiciary of the United States shall be uh, located in a Supreme Court and other courts that Congress may want to create. So it gave Congress the power to create other courts. And so the, in the Judiciary Act, uh, Congress did that, created all these other federal courts that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But the Congress also did something else in the uh, Judiciary Act of 1789. It gave the Supreme Court what's called original jurisdiction over a number of different kinds of cases. Original jurisdiction, and I'm going to talk about that more later on, means that the power to hear a case first. So if the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over something, it means that it can hear the case first and uh, you can bring the case directly to the Supreme Court. Now, John Marshall felt that that power to give uh, what Congress did by giving 
the Supreme Court original jurisdiction the power to hear a case directly rather than having a case go through other courts first and then get to the Supreme Court, as is usually the case today, where the Supreme Court will be the last court to hear a case, not the first, uh, was unconstitutional. So the uh, Supreme Court in 1803, when it heard the Marbury versus Madison case, ruled that what the Congress did in the Judiciary Act by giving the Supreme Court original jurisdiction over a case like this one, Marbury versus Madison, was unconstitutional because the Supreme because the the, the Article Three of the Constitution says that the only kind of case that the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction over is when two states sue each other, which has happened over the course of American history. And so uh, this is what Marshall ended up saying. John Marshall and the U.S. Supreme Court ended up ruling that even though they felt that Marbury should have a job, there was no power they had to order the president to do something because this case shouldn't have been brought to them because the case was brought to them pursuant to a law, the Judiciary Act of 79, that was unconstitutional. So forget about you know the details of this for a second. You don't need to memorize every every single detail. Is what's important. What's most important about Marbury versus Madison is that this is the first time the Supreme Court ever said that a law was unconstitutional. The first time they ever even thought about saying that a law was unconstitutional, and that power of judicial review has stuck. The Supreme Court has been using it ever since 1803, and because of this, the exercise of judicial review in Marbury v. Madison has made the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, a much more powerful branch of government, a much more powerful institution than the Founding Fathers ever thought it would be, ever wanted it to be. Okay, so... If we step back for a second now and talk more about how the federal court system looks like, the federal judiciary in the United States has a three-level structure. Uh, at the bottom, at the basic level, there are 94 district courts. At the middle level, there are 13 courts of appeal, and I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail uh, right I mean, in just a couple of seconds, and then one Supreme Court. So there are 94 district courts throughout the United States, 13 courts of appeal all throughout the United States, and then only one Supreme Court, which is located in, in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Okay, so let's take each, uh, each level of the court system and talk about it in more detail beginning with the lower level. So this is the low level, intermediate, highest level, district courts, courts of appeal, Supreme Court. District courts have original jurisdiction. So today, the Supreme Court only has original jurisdiction over cases where states sue each other. In most cases, the issue starts in the district court. District courts have original jurisdiction, so this is where a court case starts. Uh, and because of that, they are trial courts. Okay, so, uh, so I'll give you an example. Let's say that the FBI arrests someone in Brooklyn on suspicion of drug dealing of, uh, and it's a federal charge of drug dealing. So under the Constitution, before you can put somebody in jail, before you can find somebody guilty, you have to put them on trial. You have to prove, the government has to prove that they're guilty in a court of law before a jury. So that process is what takes place in the district courts. So district courts are where course cases start 
and it's where you have trials. So that's the most basic level, the 94 district courts. There are also 13 courts of appeal that have what we call appellate jurisdiction. So this isn't where court cases start. This is not where you have trials. Courts of appeal are not trial courts. What appellate courts do, what courts of appeal do, is that they hear issues of law and, and disputes about the law that originate out of a trial. So let's go back to the debate about uh, the, the example of, of somebody being arrested by the FBI in Brooklyn on, on federal charges of uh, drug dealing. So they're put on trial, the person's put on trial uh, in federal criminal court in Brooklyn. Uh, and actually the federal courthouse in Brooklyn is right near City Tech, right? Uh, behind uh, the uh, post office uh, on, uh, on Tillery Street. Uh, and they're found guilty. So they're found guilty of uh, drug dealing and they're sentenced to 20 years in jail, whatever. Okay. The person who is found guilty and the lawyer, his lawyer, uh, his or her lawyer, can appeal if they believe that there was a legal problem in the original trial. So let's say uh, that the uh, main piece of evidence against the person at the, at the trial was the drugs that were found uh, in the person's apartment. And the drugs were found because the FBI searched the apartment and uh, they had a warrant. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, FBI had a warrant, but there was uh, a problem with the warrant. There was some kind of technical problem with the warrant. And so there was an issue, a legal issue, about whether the search was legal under the Constitution, uh, under the Fourth Amendment, which I'm going to talk more about uh, in the uh, in the next lecture uh, when we talk about civil rights and civil liberties. So let's say there was a problem with the uh, with the uh, uh, search warrant. And so the defendant, the person who was found guilty, uh, and his lawyer argued during the trial that because there was a problem with the warrant, that the drugs should not be presented as evidence in the trial because they're obtained illegally. The government, the prosecution, argued the opposite and said that, yeah, even though there was a technical problem with the warrant, uh, it doesn't mean that the drug shouldn't be presented as evidence. And the judge agreed with the government and said, yes, I'm going to allow the uh, drugs to go into evidence. And, and mainly because of that, the person, the defendant, was found guilty. So now the, the defendant now, having been found guilty, can now appeal the case and, and take the case to the Court of Appeals, which has appellate jurisdiction, and the argument that the uh, defendant would make in the Court of Appeal was that the trial judge in the original case, the original jurisdiction case, made the wrong decision, he, he made an error, and that the Court of Appeal should overturn the conviction and order a new trial without the drugs being used as evidence. And so at the appellate court, you don't have another trial because the person would have been found guilty. All the appellate court is doing is deciding whether the trial judge in the original case made the right decision or the wrong decision with respect to allowing the drugs to be presented as evidence. If the uh, appeals court uh, says that the trial judge uh, made a mistake and that the evidence should not have been presented to the jury in the trial court, then what happens is that the original case with the conviction 
is set aside, doesn't mean anything anymore, and that the government will have to retry the defendant. But this time in the second trial, they cannot introduce the drugs as evidence because the appeals court ruled that they were legally obtained. Or, so that's one thing the appeals court could do. If the appeals court decides that the government was correct and that the trial judge did not make an error by allowing the drugs to be presented as evidence, then the defendant can appeal again, this time to the Supreme Court, all the way up to the Supreme Court. And once the Supreme Court decides something, that's it. That's the final uh, that's the final uh, 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 the final point, the final end of the line, the conclusion. So whatever the Supreme Court says would be it would be the end of this case. So that's how uh, district courts and courts of appeal work. Uh, district courts have original jurisdiction. Their trial courts is where court cases begin, and that's why there are so many of them. Ninety four all across the country. Uh, and each state has a different federal district court. Here in Brooklyn, we have, we're in the Eastern District of New York, which covers uh, Brooklyn, Queens, and then Nassau and Suffolk counties of Long Island. So any case that uh, originates in that area, so anybody who gets arrested for a federal crime in Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, or Suffolk will uh, go to trial in the Eastern District in one of the two federal courthouses in the Eastern District. And there are two of them, one here in Brooklyn, and the other is all the way out east in uh, Patchogue, uh, Hoplog, sorry, Hoplog, uh, Long Island, all the way out in Eastern Suffolk County. Uh, and so uh, if you do federal, uh, uh, if you live in Brooklyn or Queens uh, and you have to do federal jury duty, you're going to do federal jury duty either in the Brooklyn courthouse or in the Hopwell courthouse, more likely the Brooklyn courthouse because it's closer to where you live. Okay, so that's uh, how district courts work. And... Uh, uh, not every case uh, can get appealed because you can't just say that, well, I was found guilty, but the jury made made the wrong decision. You have to believe that there was a error of law, that the judge made an error of law in order to appeal something. Uh, so not all district court cases get appealed, which is why there are far less there's a far less number of appeal courts in the U.S. than there are district courts. There are only 13 appeal courts, uh, whereas there are 94 uh, district courts. Okay, so uh, let's go now to the highest level, the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the U.S., and uh, just like the appellate courts, uh, which do not uh, uh, hear appeals from every single district court case, the Supreme Court doesn't hear appeals from every appeals court case because sometimes the appeals court will rule the way the person who brings the appeal wants and then that's the end of the, end of the story. Or uh, sometimes if uh, personal appeals loses, they decide not to go any further on their own. They decide not to take it to the Supreme Court. Uh, and also the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear every case that's applied to it. And that's one of the things that makes the Supreme Court special is they get to decide whether or not to take a case. And so the Supreme Court only accepts a tiny amount of cases that apply to be heard before it. And one of the reasons is I simply don't have the capacity, the ability to hear many cases every year because they're only one of them. Uh, and they all, so they only hear cases that have a real uh, debate to them about constitutional law, something that may change the way we think and look about the Constitution. 
the way we change the, the, a, a case they'll only hear a case that changes the way we think about our rights and the law uh, that's the only kinds of cases they hear uh, so if we go back to the district court for a second uh, within the district court there are two divisions there's a criminal division and a civil division criminal the criminal division hears criminal cases and that's where the example of uh, somebody who is arrested uh, in Brooklyn for uh, on the charge of, of drug dealing on the charge of violating uh, federal drug laws uh, that's a criminal case because you're talking about violating a, a criminal law that was passed by the government criminal cases of a prosecutor and a defendant the prosecutor is the person who's uh, acting on behalf of the government to defend the law and to try to put the person who broke who is believed to have broken the law in jail the prosecutor in a federal case is called the US attorney in a state case uh, the prosecutor would be called the district attorney uh, district attorney of Brooklyn and district attorney of Queens the district attorney of the Bronx or Staten Island uh, at the federal level, the prosecutor is called a U.S. attorney. And just like federal judges, U.S. attorneys are appointed by the president, not for life, uh, for four-year terms in office. U.S. attorneys are appointed by the president. And the defendant is the person who is being charged with the crime. So the person who is who was arrested on suspicion of violating uh, federal drug laws is the defendant. Civil cases do not involve criminal law. Civil cases uh, involve what we call a tort. A tort is uh, a rule in the law that governs people's private behavior. And these are rules that uh, allow you to sue if you believe that someone has violated this uh, private behavior to your detriment. Uh, so for example, uh, one uh, tort is uh, uh, liability. So let's say, for example, uh, and I'll use an example, a more local example. Let's say I'm uh, uh, liability negligence uh, would be a tort, the example I'm using. So let's say, uh, Tomorrow morning, I go to Trader Joe's to do my shopping, to do some grocery shopping. And I'm in the uh, juice aisle. And uh, as I'm walking, I slip and fall because someone uh, had knocked over a glass bottle of juice that broke on the on the floor and spilled juice out and as i'm walking by i slip on the juice i fall and i break my leg uh, and later on i find out that that broken bottle of juice had been laying on the floor there for an hour before i fell so i could sue trader joe's on uh, uh, the tort of negligence and liability and say that they were negligent, meaning uh, they were uh, irresponsible and not careful to clean up that juice as soon as it broke. And because they didn't, that they put me in harm's way and that because I was uh, injured, because of their uh, recklessness and their uncarefulness, their carelessness, that any uh, injury that I have because of that, they're responsible for monetarily. They are responsible for paying my doctor's bills. They are responsible for paying me money now 
to for uh, work that I might miss because I'm injured. And I could also sue them for what's called pain and suffering. So they pay me money because as a result of the injury, I uh, sustained a lot of pain above, uh, you know, the, 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 the money that I put out and, and, and have to be compensated for. So there are two types of injuries here, compensatory damages and uh, pain and suffering. Uh, so that's the kind of thing here that you would uh, talk about. Uh, another tort would be, uh, you know, contracts. So if if I, uh, and, and, and to give you an example of federal level, let's say uh, I'm a business and I, I sign a contract with the federal government to uh, sell certain goods to the federal government for a certain amount of money. And then when I get paid, I don't believe that I got paid everything I'm owed, so I can sue the federal government for viol for uh, my belief that they violated the contract, and so we can go before a, a judge and a jury and ask the judge and jury to decide who's right and who's wrong, and and whether uh, I, the person doing the suing, called the plaintiff if I'm right or if the defendant the person I'm suing is right and if if I'm right if the, if the court rules that I'm right if the jury decides that I'm right then they can order the defendant to pay me the money they think I'm owed for either the difference in uh, the contract of what I think I'm owed or in the case of me uh, getting injured uh, how much money I'm owed uh, for compensatory damages to make up for what I lost or what I had to pay for doctor's bills or pain and suffering, uh, whatever they think I'm owed because I got hurt. Okay, so those are the two types of, of cases that are, uh, that are conducted in the district court, criminal cases and civil cases. So uh, beyond that, what district courts do is resolve matters of fact. And what do I mean by matters of fact? What happened? So in the case of a criminal case, let's say a uh, person who's arrested in Brooklyn on suspicion of violating drug laws, the jury and the court will have to decide whether or not uh, the person's guilty or not. That's a matter of fact. Did the person commit the crime they're being charged with and that's the jury's decision to decide whether or not the person is guilty or not guilty the judge in a district court and there's only one judge in this trial is only there to be a referee is only there to be an expert of the law to decide the rules to decide to make sure that the rules uh, of the law are followed in how the case is, is handled, but the actual decision about whether the person is guilty or not is done by the jury. And in a civil case, it's the jury that decides, am I owed money or not? Was I injured or not? Was I injured because of the other person's negligence? Yes or no? And that's a, that, again, is a matter of fact. In the courts of appeal, you're not talking about resolving matters of fact. You're talking about resolving or deciding matters of law. Uh, and in the example I used before, the matter of law in a criminal case would be, did the judge in the district court correctly rule that the drug should be presented as evidence or not? So that's not a matter of law. I mean, uh, that's not a matter of fact for a jury, uh, a, 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 a group of non-lawyers to decide, but that is instead uh, a decision for judges, experts in law. And so that's why in a court of appeals, you don't have a jury, you don't have a trial, you have a group of, of judges. And it could be either three, five, seven, nine, it's always a uh, non-number of judges 
because they all hear the case and then they all decide what they think is the resolution and then whoever uh whatever uh, if it's a if it's a group of three judges if two say yes and one say no then whoever's in the majority wins if two judges say yes the judge was right to allow the uh drugs to be in evidence then that's the ruling if uh two say no then that's the ruling if two say yes and one say no then the yeses win because that's the majority okay so uh district courts uh hand down uh matters of fact by jury courts of appeals resolve matters of law and those are decisions handed down by judges not a jury and the same for the supreme court the supreme court doesn't do trials doesn't hear matters of fact they hear matters of law and uh, then all the judges all the justices on the supreme court have their own vote and then decide uh today uh there are nine justices on the supreme court it, uh there uh throughout american history there have been less but now there are nine so the uh, constitution doesn't specify that there are nine but today there are nine there could be more or less in the future if congress decided to either increase or decrease the size of the supreme court but today there are nine uh just justices on the supreme court Okay, so as I said before, the Supreme Court only takes a small amount of cases that it is asked to consider. The Supreme Court accepts appeals from the appellate court, so it's it's uh, primarily not a court of original jurisdiction because it doesn't hear cases first. It only hears cases that have been uh, heard by other levels of the court system, mainly the appellate court. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the Supreme Court only takes cases where important constitutional issues are at stake. Uh, the only instance where the Supreme Court does hear arguments uh, under original jurisdiction where it hears cases first is where there's an argument between two states. And that has happened in the past. Doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Uh, roughly 25 years ago, uh, the state of New Jersey sued the state of New York. And the case uh, that it sued about had to do with the with Liberty Liberty Island, the uh, island that the Statue of Liberty is built on. And uh, the uh, state of New Jersey sued New York State because uh, it believed that Liberty Island is a part of uh, New Jersey. Uh, it once was part of New Jersey. If you go back all the way to uh, the early uh, early years of the United States, Liberty Island was part of New Jersey, but today it's part of New York. And uh, New Jersey was trying to argue, and, and it was not successful, but it argued that the contract where New Jersey gave New York control of Liberty Island, ownership of Liberty Island, was uh, made under duress. And under the law, if a contract is made under duress, if a contract is not entered into willingly, it's not a valid contract. You cannot force someone to make a contract with you. Both sides have to willingly and freely enter into it. And so New Jersey tried to argue to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled against New Jersey that uh, New Jersey was under duress when it turned over control of Liberty Island to New York State. Now, why is that such a big deal? Why was this such a big deal at the time? Because whoever controls Liberty Island also controls uh, the concessions, uh, the gift shop, 
and the entrance fee to the Statue of Liberty, and that's millions of dollars a year, and that all gets taxed, and because the Statue of Liberty and Liberty Island are in New York, all that tax money goes to New York State. So New Jersey wanted to reclaim control of uh, the Statue of Liberty in order to get control of all this tax money. So that's the kind of case that the Supreme Court will hear directly as a case of original jurisdiction, whereas most cases come to the Supreme Court up through the district courts, through the appellate court, and then to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is mostly a court of appellate jurisdiction, except when it comes to hearing arguments between two states. So the Supreme Court operates very differently from other courts because it is not bound by precedent. They can make new precedent. What is a precedent? A precedent is a legal uh, habit where you uh, respect decisions that have been, been made in the past. So for example, uh, if a case goes to the appellate court about, for example, should drugs that are obtained from a certain type of warrant or a warrant that had this kind of mistake on it, should they should those drugs be entered into uh, entered into evidence? The appellate court, when it looks at the uh, case, can't just decide whatever it wants. It has to look at what the Supreme Court has ruled previously and what other courts have ruled previously, and then rule that same way, meaning according to the precedent that was set by the Supreme Court and other courts. The Supreme Court, however, can totally change and make a new precedent. So, for example, if uh, the Supreme Court, uh, so, for example, the Supreme Court in 1973 said that the Constitution guarantees women the right to have an abortion under certain circumstances. But for the most part, States cannot prevent women from having an abortion in most circumstances. Uh, that was a really big decision uh, that was made in 1973 in the case of Roe v. Wade. It was a very controversial decision that people are still arguing about today. Many people believe that the Supreme Court's decision was wrong and that the Constitution does not actually protect a woman's right to have an abortion. And many uh, people who disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision want the Supreme Court today to overturn Roe v. Wade and state that because the Constitution does not guarantee women the right to an abortion, it is legal for states to pass laws that totally prohibit women from having an abortion. Uh, so the Supreme Court could do that. Because even though Roe v. Wade is the Supreme Court precedent, the Supreme Court itself is not bound by its own precedents. It can make new precedents. The Supreme Court uh, next year could take an abortion case and rule that what the Supreme Court said in 1973 was totally wrong and that the Constitution does not allow women to have an abortion and so from now on, states can ban abortion. And if that happened, many states probably would ban abortion. So this is a big deal. And that's why the Supreme Court's uh, ability uh, to make new precedent and not have to be bound by its own precedents is a really big deal, is a really big, important uh, power that the Supreme Court has to shape American law, American federal law, and American constitutional law. Okay, so as I said before, all federal judges are appointed by the president and they are confirmed by the Senate. So the president will say to the Senate, 
this is a person I've picked for this uh, to be a district court judge or an appellate court judge or a Supreme Court justice. And then the Senate will get to vote yes or no. If the Senate votes yes, then that person becomes a judge. If the Senate votes no, then the pr that person doesn't become a judge and then the president can turn around and appoint somebody else uh, for that position. Okay. The confirmation process has become very political. Uh, as I said before, the Founding Fathers did not want the courts to be political, but they become political. And the confirmation process itself has become very political. Uh, just in the past three years, uh, Donald Trump has uh, nominated, appointed two Supreme Court justices two new Supreme Court justices, and in both cases, the Senate debate over those two Supreme Court uh, nominees of President Trump have been very, very political, very controversial, with Republicans totally supporting the president's nominees, and for the most part, Democrats totally uh, uh, not supporting uh, the president's nominees. Supreme Court justices have two basic judicial ways of thinking. They have two basic ways of looking at the law and of, of shaping the law, of thinking about the law. One is called judicial restraint. One is called judicial activism. Uh, judicial restraint is a type of, of thinking about the law that is a very conservative way of thinking about the law that is the way of thinking that most Republican judges, judges who have been appointed by Republican presidents, think about the law. And, then, and so the way they think is, is uh, 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 basically embodied by the title, Judicial Restraint, they think that judges should be very strained in the way they think about the law, the way they interpret the law, that they should look exactly what the law says and not think about what's going on in the political world, not what's going on uh, around society, not look at how society has changed, but simply look just at the law and say what the law means and stick to, 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 to precedent, stick to tradition, uh, that if things are the way they've always been, that's the way they should always be, and we shouldn't uh, try to make the law uh, grow with the way society has grown, which is the way that judicial activism believes. So judicial activist judges believe that the law should grow to reflect the changes in society. That just because things have been done a certain way doesn't mean they should always be done a certain way. That things change and the law should change as society changes. And so judges who are judicial activists and they are mainly lib more liberal judges, judges who have been appointed by Democratic presidents, tend to uh, think about the law more through the lens of judicial activism. And so I'll give you an example. One big legal change in the past uh, 10, 15 years, the issue of gay marriage. So gay marriage uh, became legal in the early 2000s, or I mean, the mid 2000s, I should say, uh, when the state of Massachusetts became the first state to legally allow gay and lesbian couples to uh, get married legally in the state. And that uh, decision was based on a court case that was. Uh, brought in the, uh, before the uh, state court system in Massachusetts. And the top, uh, the court case ended with the top Massachusetts 
court, their Supreme Court, their state Supreme Court, ruling that the Massachusetts Constitution uh, required the state to allow gay marriage because the Massachusetts Constitution, state constitution, guarantees everyone what we call equal protection of the law. So according to the state constitution of Massachusetts, and this is also true for most state constitutions like the state constitution of New York, all the people living in the state have to be treated equally by the law. And so Massachusetts, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Supreme Court said that because uh, state law allows uh, people to get marriage licenses because marriage is a legal institution in states like Massachusetts, that that legal institution has to be open not just to heterosexual couples, as was the case before this case in Massachusetts, but it also has to be open to gay and lesbian couples as well, because gay and lesbian couples have to be treated equally. And so that was a big, big decision. And then after that, other states started slowly allowing gay marriage to be legal, either by court rulings or by the, there are state legislature passing laws, which was the case here in New York, where in New York uh, state gay marriage became legal when the uh, state legislature in Albany decided to pass a law allowing gay and lesbian couples to be married in New York. And then finally, in 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution of the United States also allows, uh, also requires uh, gay couples, gay and lesbian couples to uh, be allowed to legally marry throughout the United States because up to that point, uh, at that point, uh, there were still several states in the United States where gay marriage was still not legal. And so when the Supreme Court ruled that way, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that way, that made it uh, made all these other state laws that still did not allow uh, gay marriage to suddenly become unconstitutional. Why? Because of one of the things I talked about in chapter in the lecture on chapter two, the Constitution, the supremacy clause. That when a Supreme Court ruling or federal law uh, conflicts with state law, the federal government's ruling and law trumps the state law. So now, because of the uh, the Supreme Court ruling, every gay and lesbian couple, no matter where they live, has the right to uh, be legally married in uh, the United States. And so that court ruling uh, is an example of judicial activism because the part of the Constitution that it relied on, the Equal Protection Clause, this, this idea that everyone has a right to be treated equally, never applied before to gay and lesbian couples. And so the Supreme Court in 2013 uh, and state courts before that expanded the uh, the interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause to include gay and lesbian couples who are looking to get married. The Supreme Court justices, both at the federal level and in states that uh, who ruled that their constitutions did not protect gay marriage were operating in a more judicial restraint way of thinking by saying, well, equal protection was never interpreted and never meant to apply to gay marriage before, so it shouldn't start now. We need to keep things the way they are. Uh, so that way of thinking uh, 
judicial restraint versus judicial activism is two very different ways of thinking about the very same piece of law, the equal protection clause in constitutions that say you have to treat everyone equally. So you can take one uh, one law that's the same, it's written the same way for everybody, and interpret in two very different ways depending on what kind of judge you are, whether you're a judge who believes in judicial restraint as a way of thinking about the law, or whether you're a judge who thinks about judicial activism as a way of thinking. And because uh, Supreme Court justices especially have this ability to change the way we interpret the Constitution and to make new precedent, judges at um, justices on the Supreme Court uh, are very have a very very important power, and it's a power that they have for life. Unlike presidents who only serve for four years or members of Congress who only serve for two or six years, so that's why the judiciary, even though it was meant to be a smaller a branch of government is actually now uh, a very powerful branch of government. And that's the end. Uh, I'll see you uh, for our next uh, lecture, our next chapter, which is going to be on uh, civil rights and civil liberties.